They will lead us through their journeys through the Master of Science and Executive Leadership Program, provide you some insights as to the experiences that they have had and what it might mean for all of you. So with that, it is my privilege and honor to introduce Mr. Gary Rich. Well, only because I got off a plane from Australia last night is my Australian accent in very fine form today. <laughs> So I want you to listen to me, not to my accent, but I will give you an official g'day. So g'day. g'day. Yeah. Uh, I am delighted, and I know Ken is delighted to be here today, to share with you some of the magnificent pieces of the journey that you may choose to take if you challenge yourself to be a better leader and do that through the journey of the MSEL program. I was fortunate enough to be in cohort one of the MSEL program um, back in 1999, that was at a time that I'd just been given the opportunity to lead WD-40. Uh, I was in my late 30s, I, um, I was the CEO of a public company, but I felt that I was consciously incompetent. I felt there were things about leadership that I needed to know more about I needed to sharpen my saw on. I looked at an MBA program, and MBAs are magnificent programs, but everybody's got one of those. I wanted something that was very exclusive, something you had to explain to people. <laughs> and that's what the MSEL program is. It's something you have to explain to people, and that's because it's so special. So I went off with a, a mission. I wanted to um, l learn what I didn't know and confirm what I thought I knew. And I went on a 22-month journey uh, through the MSEL program. And I did learn. Uh, I learned that being with a group of people of different backgrounds and different learnings was a great learning environment. The cohort learning environment is a beautiful one. And I learned that I was consciously incompetent. <laughs> I also learned that it's all about the people. And it's really the road that it took me on. I learned that as leaders, when we get up every morning, we put on the badge of leadership. And that badge of leadership says, I am taking responsibility for you. Now, we have no right to mess with people's lives. Because people do enough to mess with their own lives. So who are we to get in, into that deal? But what we can do as leaders is make sure that we totally understand who we are trying to lead and who we are trying to create a situation where they are going to create memories that are magnificent. In life, we only have one thing, and that's a memory. At the end of the day, all you have is memories. And our job in life is to create positive, lasting memories. The reason I was down in Australia this week is I was visiting my mum. Mum's 97 years old. And um, Sally, are you quacking? <laughs> Someone's quacking. There we go. Mum's 97 years old, and, um, and uh, she'd, uh, she's a, a spark. But I, I love her for one reason, not one, and, and one reason alone. <laughs> she gives unconditional love. And um, one of the things that we learn about as we are leaders is that in life, a good contrarian or a good resistor is great to have because we know it all, we think, but we don't. And my mum is, has unconditional love at 97. And I went down there to um, help her move into a facility that is going to keep her safe because at 97, even though she's got a... All the wits about her, she, her body's a little rusty. She says she needs some more WD-40. <laughs> but this thing about all, and I tell this story about unconditional love because it's all about the essence of WD-40 is, I call it a cup of tea with mum. And let me share it with you. Um, going down to Australia, you jump on a 747 or an A380 or whatever aircraft you like up in LA, and about 15 hours later, early in the morning, you land in Sydney. 
And uh, I'd jump in a rented car and I drive, I used to drive out to our family home where mum had lived for 70 years. And as I put the key in the door, the door would open. It was no different to when I was 18 coming home at 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> they, she was always there with the door open. And the first thing she'd say, she would always say to me, where have you been, Gary? And it, whether I was coming from the United States or late home for a party, that's what I got. <laughs> but the great thing is, mum would say, come on in, come on in. And we'd go to the kitchen table in the kitchen of the house. It's a you know, 70 plus year old house, a Californian bungalow. But I, I think the kitchen table, it must be the original kitchen table. And she'd say, sit down and have a cup of tea. Now, whether you've had 30 cups of tea on, uh, on the aeroplane or not, you're having a cup of tea. And whether you want it or not, there's cake on the table. And it's sit down. And for the next however long you can stand it, you get, now, Gary, this is what you should be doing. And this is what you should do. And why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And how about this? And how about that? And blah, 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 yap, yap, yap. And you sit there and you've heard it all before and, and a lot of it's true and you've never taken any notice of it and you may pick up one or three of these things and, and, and you'd say, yeah, okay, I should do something about it. And at the end of it, you've had your cup of tea and you walk out the door and the door closes and you go off on your way of life. And as you walk out the front gate and we have a swinging front gate that still squeaks and as that squeak closes, the thing that comes into my head is, I can't wait for my next cup of tea with mum. And that's one of the things you'll learn in the MSEL program, is that as leaders, there are traits that we need to understand. We need, need to under the, understand the trait of leadership that contrarians and resistors are people of value. We learn to, in the MSEL program on how you can create an environment of trust, how you can create an environment where people will know you're able, know you're believable, know you're connected and know you're dependable. You'll learn how to hold yourself accountable around those A, B, C, Ds of trust. You'll learn how to create an environment where people actually want to go to work. Surprise, surprise. You know, today, what's sad, 71% of people who got up and went to work today were not engaged in what they were going to be doing, which means they were either going to actively or passively work against the goals of, our, of, of the organisation they work for. I think that's pretty sad. Whose fault is that? Ours, as leaders. At WD40 Company today, 93% of people who go to work are engaged. Why? Because we have a clear vision a clear set of values, and we respect the people, we hold them accountable. Southwest Airlines is a beautiful example of an engaged company and, and the power of an employer brand. You know, Southwest Airlines is the only airline in the United States that's made money consistently for 40 years. And it's not coincidental that a year ago when they went online and opened their employment uh, online employment application for flight attendants that they had to close down the website an hour and 10 minutes after they opened it because they were flooded with people who wanted to work at Southwest Airlines. Do you think that attitude comes across when you go on Southwest Airlines? You know, what do you get? Peanuts and fun. A good seat and a safe arrival. That's the power of an employer brand because, and those people are engaged. I'm not sure whether it, if on airline A over here, they have the same outcome. I don't know that their website would have been bombarded with people wanting to work for them. So it, learning how to encourage people to work in an environment where they're valued is so important. Values are so important in an organisation. And we don't pay attention to them enough. And in an MSEL program, you'll learn the power of values. Values are like the banks of a river. The, the river starts at the top and ends at the ocean. Where would it be without banks? It'd be a big lake that'd stink in the end because it'd be stagnant. I love Tori telling the story about values because I can mention a little bit about my daughter. Kate, uh, my daughter went to uh, Long Beach and when she was at Long Beach University, and when she was um, working at Long Beach, she actually worked at Disneyland, which is pretty cool, because I like Disneyland. But what is really cool, she was Mickey Mouse. <laughs> S 
So today, you have Mickey Mouse's dad here. <laughs> and the other thing is, that you didn't know, Mickey Mouse is really Australian. <laughs> but why did I share that with you? The first thing that they taught Kate when she went to Disneyland was the power of values. And values should be hierarchical. What is the most important thing? And, and does anybody want to guess what the number one value at Disney is? Safety. Safety. Normally, most people say, fun. And you would think, it might be fun because it's a fun place. But it is safety, and why is it safety? Well, it's so Mickey Mouse knows what to do. <laughs> because if Mickey is on stage in costume and Mickey is entertaining little Susie and little Johnny falls over, Mickey knows what to do. Even if little Susie starts crying and throwing a fit, Mickey knows to go to little Johnny which is really important. The other thing that we learn about is, in MSCL, is the power, of, really the power of learning. I was reminded of this when Sully, the uh, captain who flew that airline into the Hudson River and saved the lives of thousands. Sully had a beautiful, beautiful saying that came out of that. He said, over my lifetime, I've deposited many, many single events of learning in my learning bank. So much that at the time I needed to make a huge withdrawal, it was there for me to take out. So learning is not an event. Learning is a journey. We're continually learning. You know, I, I share with people, why waste getting older if we're not getting wiser? You know, what's the use of it? And the power of learning in an organisation is so important. We say at WD-40 Company, we don't make mistakes, we have learning moments. <laughs> because a learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that can be openly and shared without fear. Fear is the biggest disabler you have in life. We didn't, in the times, hard economic times, we didn't stop spending when we lost our jobs because 90% of people didn't lose their jobs, but we stopped spending. We stopped spending because we were afraid we were going to lose our job. And that's the area that we've got to take out, is that fear. We've got to give people the confidence that the leadership within organisations is going to create an atmosphere where they feel safe. We didn't lay anyone off at all in the global financial crisis. In fact, we employed people. In fact, the year after, we had the best year in the company's 57-year history. And why? I believe it's because we had the power of the people that were highly engaged, that said, we're gonna get through this, and uh, we accepted the responsibility. The other thing that we've gotta be clear about with people is, do they belong? We call WD-40 a tribe, not a team. And why do we do that? If you're all aware of Maslow's theory, you know, the bottom rung is, you know, have you got food? And the next one is, you know, are you safe? And the third one is, do you belong? Hands up anybody in this room who's ever left a party or a dinner because they felt they just didn't belong there, they weren't welcome. Put your hand up. <laughs> Beautiful. How many people do you think leave organisations because they feel like they don't belong. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we forget that. And what we learn in the MSCL program is how do we create an, an organisation where people belong, where they feel like they're making a difference, where they're doing meaningful work. Who would have thought that selling WD-40 was doing meaningful work? Well, it is. Our vision is to solve problems in the homes, to solve problems and create positive lasting memories in the homes and factories of the world. And while we're doing that, we're helping people learn, create, give, all of the important things of life because we say and we show them that they belong. We do an employee opinion survey every two years at WD40 and uh, 
the current one is being done right now. So I'm excited to hear the results of this one that we're out. The last one was done right in the middle of the global financial crisis. And uh, it's done globally. It's done in about seven languages. It's completely voluntary and completely confidential. You don't have to do it and we don't know who you are. We get about a 98% participants rate. The reason we get that is because people know we do something with the information. But the number one, the number one rated question with 99% positive from our tribe globally was, at WD40 Company, I'm treated with respect and dignity. The number two was, my supervisor respects me. The number three was, I know what results are expected of me. The number four was, I'm encouraged to have a different point of view. I didn't dream all, I didn't dream all this up. I'm not that smart. WD-40 company today wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for the MSEL program. And for the 18, 18 people in my company that have, or, well now there's, wait a minute. 17 and three to, 16 and three to come, that'll be 19, because there's three in the current cohorts, who have master's degrees in executive leadership. Our company from 1999 on was built on the principles that we learned, all of us, here at the MSEL program. And our record shows. We are a publicly listed company that performs and does what it says. My job spec is easy. I say I'm in the memories business. My job is to create positive lasting memories with three constituent groups. Our end users, the people who use our product around the world every day. Our people, those people who come to work at WD-40 and those people who interact with WD-40 every day. And our shareholders, the people who trust us with their investment every day. So every day when I get up, I think about three things, our brands, our people, and our shareholders. And then we go to work. But it wasn't that I could do that. The MSEL, prog MSEL program gave me the opportunity to learn that if you understand the power of people and you can let go of your ego, let go of yourself, and you can engage them and allow them to have fun executing around excitement and care, accountability and responsibility, you can have an amazing, amazing company that's just a lot of fun. So um, I think that if you want to change your life and you have enough guts to do it, come to the MSEL program. But I'm going to warn you, if you do come, you'll be different when you leave. And it will be a good difference. Um, Ken Blanchard, who I can now call a friend of mine, I met at MSEL, and I would never have thought that in 2012 I'd be on a stage introducing Ken as my friend and as someone that I've had the privilege of learning so much from, co-authoring a book with, I now sit on Ken's board, and um, that all came, that would not have happened if I hadn't have come, come to you, the University of San Diego met Ken and gone forward from there and, um, and just had a wonderful time doing it. So now that I've messed it up, as Ken said, I'll come after you and mop up after you, Gary. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it's my pleasure to ask uh, Ken Blanchard to uh, come and share really the inspiration that really made this program. Thanks, Ken. Good to see you all. Um, you know, Gary's uh, excited about our program, but let me just give you a big picture. I'm excited about the University of San Diego. Uh, it's really interesting when Marge and I came here. <clears throat> we came on a <clears throat> one-year sabbatical leave uh, from the University of San Diego, I mean, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst uh, in 1956. We were coming for one year. And after a while, Margie said, this is crazy. You know, summer in Massachusetts is two weeks of bad skating. Uh, and um, so we ended up staying here. And early on when we stayed here, we got a call from Sister McMonagle, who as some of you might have known at the University of San Diego. She made 
Mother Teresa seemed like she was mean-spirited. You know, I mean, and uh, she asked Marge and I to, if we would come down and share with parents in a parents' weekend. We had never been down here, and we came to this beautiful campus and then started to get to know uh, people over time. And uh, so uh, I'm glad you're all here, because this is a great institution uh, that I think is fabulous. And a number of you here are not only interested in the MSEL program, but are in other programs that we have. And I think we have some fabulous programs with our global program and our MBA programs and, and all. And so um, uh, I'm excited ab about that. And, and I got lucky enough to get involved, you know, Margie and I, in helping create this program Gary was talking about. And because I, I had looked at a lot of graduate programs and business and all that, and I thought, I found out two things they didn't do. One is they taught very little about leadership. It was kind of tucked in an organizational behavior class. And how many of you know that leadership makes a major difference? I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, Jim Collins, you know, wrote, wrote Good to Great, had a follow-up book uh, a couple of years ago called Why the Mighty Fall. And what is it really about is it takes a whole community, as Gary was saying, to create a great organization like WD-40, but it takes one idiot to come in and send it into the tubes, uh, you know, into the toilet, uh, who's got a big ego, who thinks leadership's all about them, and all that kind of thing. And so uh, leadership's so powerful and important. Uh, and the, the big issue around the world is I think people are really sick and tired of self-serving leadership. Uh, leaders who think it's all about them. We've seen it in every domain, uh, whether it be business, education, religion, politics, and all. I mean, isn't it a shame the way the political system has gone, you know? I was saying to Gary, it's so stupid that they have debates. Why aren't they problem-solving sessions? And let them do a series of sessions on what are the major problems we have in our country? We got problems around unemployment. We got problems around health care. We got problems with education and all. And bring the candidates together to talk about the problems, not to beat each other up, but what are their solutions? And how can we see them in a dialogue and all so we get to see how their minds work and all, not how they beat each other up and act like, you know, this guy's an idiot or how come he is, you know, because, you know, all these issues they argue about, they have nothing to do with anything. We ought to get out of people's personal lives. Uh, and we ought to get into what are the issues that we have in our country. Uh, people have asked me if I would write the one minute manager goes to Washington. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, so I've been playing around with it. But there's three secrets I would share uh, with them. And they're really secrets that, that we teach in this program and I think get taught in a lot of the programs at the university. The first secret is that we don't have a vision anymore in this country. And Gary talked about the power of having a vision and a set of operating values and all. See, a compelling vision tells you who you are, what business we're in. We don't know what business we're in as a country. Are we supposed to defend democracy around the world? Have we all agreed upon that? Or are we supposed to you know, take care of our own people and create a great economic uh, machine so that people aren't hungry, people aren't homeless, or what, you know, I mean, but what is our, what business are we in? We don't know. Secondly, uh, is what's the picture of the future? If you do a great job, what will happen in the future? You know, what are we, what are we going to accomplish? We don't know where, where the, Gary's saying, we got to know what the results are. I mean, that's, that's so important. The first secret of the one minute manager was what? One minute goal setting. All good performance starts with clear goals. And we don't have any clear goals that are, we've agreed upon that we're gonna, gonna work on. And uh, so, uh, and then the last is, what's gonna manage your journey, which is what are your values? And we don't have agreed upon a set of values that we can say to senators or other people, so I'm sorry, that's inconsistent with our values. What are the values in the country? The squeaky wheel, you know, uh, lobbyists and all that kind of thing, rather than the set of operating values. Gary mentioned uh, WD-40. I wrote a book with Colleen Barrett, the former president of WD-40. Why, why, not WD-40, Southwest. Southwest. Uh, and uh, why are they the only airline that's made money? Because they have a compelling vision. Everybody knows. You know what business they're in? You ask any of them. We're in the customer service business. We happen to fly airplanes. You know what their picture of the future is? That every American should have an opportunity to be with a friend and a loved one in a happy time and a sad time. 
They want to democratize the airways. And they have four values that drive their behavior that everybody knows. Number one, as Gary was saying with Disney, is safety because of the business they're in. Then they have three values that they haven't rank ordered because they want people to engage in them all three every single day. One is a warrior spirit, which is that if you got a job, do it. That's why they can turn around a plane in 10 or 12 minutes, because pilots are in there throwing the garbage out with the, with the stewardesses and all that kind of, they don't say it's not my job and all. Man, we got a job, we can't make money if the planes aren't in the air. Second is a servant's heart, and I've never seen another organization that had a value of a servant's heart, and they hire people for that. Colleen was telling me an interesting story recently. You know, they bought AirTran, you probably know, but if you go in the airport, AirTran is still AirTran. You know why? They're not going to make them Southwest for 18 months until they make sure that they're part of their culture and that they really buy into their vision and all. They don't want people, suddenly we bought them, we put Southwest up, and that doesn't seem like Southwest. I mean, how many other companies would do something like that? But they're looking for new pilots. And a top pilot, I think he was from Delta, flew down there to interview. And the report was that he was rude to the staff on the plane. And then he got in the corporate headquarters. You go in the corporate headquarters of Southwest, it's a big sign that says, we the people of Southwest. Because you know who their number one customer is? Their people. They think if they treat their people well with golden rule behavior, and they, they name that uh, behavior, then they will uh, get excited and they can empower them and all. And they'll get passionate about work. And then they'll take care of what? The number two customer which is the people who fly the airlines. And uh, if they do a good job then, the people want to come back, and that takes care of the number three most important customer, who? The, the stockholders and the owners. And what does Wall Street push? The only reason to be in business is to make money. And they might care about customers a little bit, but people are interchangeable parts. You know, let's forget about them now. And all, duh. You know, WD-40 didn't let anybody go in the tough times. Southwest didn't let anybody go in the tough times. Blanchard didn't let anybody go in the tough times. What? Everybody shared some of the pain. We said, how can we do this together? What can we all, how can we cut costs? What can we do? Because that gets to the second thing that I would tell people in Washington. You got to use the citizens as your partners. You got to look at your people and your business as your partners, not something separate. Why don't we have enough information? A friend of mine just wrote a book. He was the head of IBM about uh, you know, information, informing the voters about how we can rebuild America. And he knows a lot about it. And he went in there and shared, we are in a disaster financially. I mean, I don't know if you, you all really know what a disaster. So is California. We should both be out of business. But has anybody come to the citizens to say, here's the problem? I was telling Gary, I was just in Australia two weeks ago. <clears throat> An old buddy of ours, Lindsey Fox, who when we first met him in 1977, he, he's an old truck driver, had about 30 trucks, was doing about seven or eight million dollars as part of the Young Presidents Organization. He now is three billion, and they're doing the logistics for all the major companies in Australia and about 10 or 12 countries in Asia and all. And they had uh, an a, uh, employment problem in Australia, Australia, just like we have. So Lindsay went with the head of commerce or whatever, the government down in Canberra, and they flew around the country for two or three weeks, went to every town and said, let us tell you what the problem is. And what I want to know is how many new jobs is this community going to create? Let's brainstorm. And in two weeks, they created 100,000 new jobs. Why? Because they went to the people and said, here's the deal. How can you help? I mean, how many of you would willing to participate a little bit financially on making sure that we didn't own billions of dollars to China? You know, I mean, you know, if we, if we had, you know, here's the data. I mean, China owns all, a good share of this country. But we don't know. And so we don't, we don't do anything. So we don't create any people as our partners. And, and what Gary has done at WD-40, and they've done it at... Uh, uh, Southwest is their people or their partners. I mean, one of the things that Gary knew intuitively but learned specifically is all the brains aren't in your office. One of the favorite sayings from our program is none of us is as bright as all of us. None of us is as smart as all of us. 
and that what you ought to do is involve your people as if they had some brains and, and all. A lot of people don't know that Southwest Airlines is 86% union. People say, I can't believe it, you know. They aren't fighting or anything like that. Because when they went to vote for unions a number of years, they came to Herb Kelleher and said, they've asked us to vote for unions. He said, I love unions. He said, as long as they permit you to sit on the same side of the table as me. They want you to sit on the opposite table, vote against them. Every meeting I've ever been at Southwest, all the union leaders are there. I was signing books with Colleen. She had a party in Dallas because, you know, she never thought that she would write a book. You know, she, you know, didn't go to a lot of college and everything. In fact, she was Herb Kelleher's executive secretary for over 20 years. And when Herb stepped down, he says, Colleen, you know these people better than anybody else. You'll be president. She won every award in the airline industry for, for leadership. First woman ever to do it. I mean, it was unbelievable. And uh, I'm sitting there signing a book, and this one woman came up, and I said, what's your relation to this young lady? She said, oh, for 25 years, I've been a president of the Stewart un Stewardess Union. I said, and she's a good friend of her? She said, I love her. And then Colleen turned to me, and I love her too. You know, they got up and gave each other a big <laughs> hug, you know? I mean, you know, I mean, why, uh, duh. You know, sometimes I think I'm coming from Mars, you know, and say, you know, because uh, am I not making common sense? I mean, geez, you know. And the third thing that I would uh, share with them is you got to be servant leaders. And that's a big pitch that we have in our program, is that you're not there to, to be served, you're there to serve. And a lot of times when I talk about servant leadership, they think it's about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody. No, it's the only way to get great results and great human satisfaction. And the reason people raise their eyebrows when they hear about servant leadership is that they don't understand it, you know, and they... Uh, don't realize there's two parts of servant leadership. One is the leadership part of servant leadership, which is what? Vision, direction, values, and the kind of thing that Gary's talking about. All the great organizations have a clear vision, a clear set of values, and goals that people know what's expected of them. That's the leadership part. That's the responsibility of the leader. It doesn't mean you don't involve people, but it's your job to make sure your people understand where you're going, why you're going there, what are the that you want them to focus on right now, what does good behavior look like. That's the leadership part, because leadership's about going somewhere. If people don't know where you're going, you've got very little chance of getting there. You go, duh, I wonder how we're not getting performance. Well, did anybody mention what we're doing? Parents do that all the time. They don't tell their kids what they want from them until they don't give it to them. What are these grades? I can't believe it. Well, you never mentioned anything <laughs> that you had any of these kind of expectations, you know. And uh, so that's the leadership part. And, and the, the traditional hierarchies, live and well, but you involve people. Now that you've moved to the second part, which is implementation, which is how do we live according to the vision and accomplish the goals, now you've got to philosophically turn the pyramid upside down because what now? Now all the top management and everybody works for everybody who works for everybody who eventually works for the customers. And when you do that, now you suddenly create eagles, not ducks. Wayne Dyer years ago talk, you know, talked about ducks and eagles, quack, 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 quack. Because you can always tell a company where you're run by self-serving leaders if you're dealing with them as a customer. Because they'll say, quack, quack, it's our policy. Quack, quack, I didn't make the freaking rules. Quack, quack, you know, do you want to talk to my supervisor? Quack, 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 you know. And uh, they act like, you know, they can't, they can't use their brains. See? And where if you run into a company like WD-40 or Southwest, the people can use their brains. My favorite Southwest story that I love to tell is, you know, when I travel, I have this thing I put around my neck. I call it my geezer pouch. You know, you get older, you know, you, you uh, forget things and all. My geezer pouch, I have my license, my passport if I need it, my itinerary, pen and pencil, you know, anything I need. You know, I go around the air, what do you need? I got it here, you know. And so I've been trying to get my wife Margie to get a geezer pouch, but she doesn't think it looks cool. But you can't find anything in that damn pocketbook. Uh, and, uh, but... Uh, one day I loaded my beauty up and I left it on my desk at home and I'm pulling into the airport in San Diego. No official identification. Three years after 9-11, so a little uptight still. 
Uh, and so the only book I've ever written, I got my picture in the front cover, is the one I did with Don Shula, the old Miami Dolphins coach. And uh, you know, we wrote a book called Everyone's a Coach. So I ran into the bookstore, and then luckily they had a copy. So I bought it. And the first, <laughs> first airline I had to go to was Southwest. And the guy's checking my bag out in the street. And he said, could I see your identification? I said, I feel badly. I don't have a license passport. But how's this? And I held up the book. The guy looked at it. He said, this man knows Don Shula. <laughs> he said, put him in first class. You know, I mean, they don't have first class. You know, <laughs> They didn't even have business select then. And they're high-fiving me. Hey, the guy knows Shula. You know, and, you know. And there's an older guy there who said, I know the security guard's upstairs. I can get you through there, too, which he did. Now, why is that? Because they let him use their brains. I mean, they didn't assume I had superimposed my picture on this book <laughs> to get by them. Plus, they also know the bigger deal is, do I have any weapons you know, to, to go through there? And so next airline I went to before they had overnight my thing was one of the big ones always talking about, you know, uh, they, you know 9-11, in fact, they joined the crowd recently and, and went uh, to, uh, you know, bankrupt, you know, so they could break all the agreements with the unions and all. That's really great strategies. Uh, and we support that. Uh, and uh, so uh, I showed my book out in the street, and man, the duck doo-doo started to fly, you know I mean? You know, quack, you better talk to the ticket counter. And I showed the woman the ticket counter. She said, quack, you better talk to my supervisor. We call the supervisory duck the head mallard because they just, <laughs> they just quack at a higher level, you know, and they tell you rules and laws and all. Pretty soon I'm up about four or five levels talking to a guy in a suit and a tie. So I started to give him a hard time and I could see he was a bureaucrat. You can always tell the bureaucrats they have very tight underwear on and they would <laughs> kind of walk like this, you know. And uh, so uh, I had to change my tactics. So I said to him, what a difficult job you have. You know, I mean, trying to make decisions like this, you know, and all. So I sucked up the hierarchy and he let me on the plane. But uh, so what we teach is that, and so what, what, the, what Washington needs to do is set a vision and a set of values and some goals and then turn the pyramid upside down. They work for us. We don't work for them. You know, I was a government major. The, the founding fathers never imagined that politics would be a career. Why is House of Representatives two years? Because in those days, you couldn't travel back and forth, you know, from the, the 13 states we had. So they assumed that somebody might be willing to give two years of their life up to serve the government. Then you go back home and somebody else comes. The only reason the Senate was longer is they thought somebody ought to know uh, the city. And now it's just all about getting reelected. It's all, I mean, here's Obama's running for president again. He's still got, you know, a long time in this thing, you know, and, and so it's, it's nuts. So maybe I ought to write that book. Yeah. I don't think, yeah, yeah really. But they probably wouldn't read it, but everybody else would. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, uh, but that gives you a flavor of some of the things that we teach are important. And I want to just kind of end by just telling you, I just came out with a fun book that I think applies to you all in all the programs you're in in the business school here and all. It says, it's great leaders grow. It's uh, becoming a leader for life. And I wrote it with Mark Miller, who's the uh, head of training for Chick-fil-A, another one of the great companies, duh. You know, here, here Chick-fil-A has 1,600 restaurants. They're not open on Sunday. They absolutely kill everybody in that industry on every measurement that you want to have. Employee satisfaction, turnover. And all. They got less than 2% turnover in their restaurant managers out of 1,600. Men. They have 75 to 100% less turnover at the hourly level than anybody in the business. You know, I mean, because the young people that come to work with them, they say, we know you're not, probably not going to have your career here, although Mark started at 16, and this is his 33rd year with, with Chick-fil-A. But they said, we're going to teach you life skills. We're going to teach you skills that are going to make you a better parent, a better citizen, a better spouse, and all that, because we're going to teach you about how to serve. In fact, I wrote a book earlier with Mark called Great Leader, you know, uh, The Secret, What a Great Leader's Think and Do. They serve, and they, they train all of their people in the serve model. S is see and shape the future. It's about visioning. E is about engage and develop people. 
And, and R is what this book's about. Reinvent yourself continuously, as well as the organization's policies, structures, and all. V is to value both people and results. Gary was talking about that. It's not an either or. It's a both and. And then finally, embody the values. And now they're excited because they said, you know, God, everybody's really getting that. But we want to make sure that all of our people are continuing to grow. And so grow is an acronym for what you need to do. And I want to tell you, all of you that take the time to get into one of the programs here, and of course we love the MSEL program, is you're going to grow because G is to gain knowledge. What do you need to gain knowledge constantly? About yourself. The first course in our program is all about yourself. Uh, it's learning, you know, uh, getting a DISC instrument, Myers-Briggs, learning your leadership point of view, all kinds of things about yourself. I think one of the problems with a lot of leaders, they don't even know who they are. And they don't feel necessarily good about themselves and who they are. Because in this program, you learn about your strengths and weaknesses. And don't beat yourself up for your weaknesses. You hire people to fill those weaknesses. <laughs> and you keep on, you know, you know, I mean, I'm the chief spiritual officer. I'm a cheerleader and all. I, I couldn't implement anything, you know? <laughs> Uh, so that's just not my skill. And uh, so I got people gathered around me who are implementers. You know, Margie and I walk around. We got a campus up in Escondido. We couldn't even spell the word entrepreneur. Now we is one, you know? <laughs> we got five buildings up there. We got, you know, partners. Uh, I mean, an office in Toronto, London, Singapore, partners in 30 nations. We got 320 people uh, on, our, on our payroll. Uh, I mean, and we walk around. This is ridiculous, you know? And why? Because we found people that could do things. You know, Margie and I couldn't even balance our own checkbook, you know. And, of course, our vice president for finance went through the program. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but, uh, so you got to learn about yourself. The second is you got to learn about other people, the people that you're working with. And that's one of the big things, you know, Gary's talking about with, you know, having conversations with your mom is the kind of things you want to have with your people. We push people to have one-on-ones. What means is you ought to meet every one of you for at least 15 to 30 minutes once every two weeks with each of your direct reports. And as a manager, it's your job to schedule a meeting, but they set the agenda. They can talk about anything they want. And of course, they're going to talk about how they're doing and their goals, if you've got goals for them and all. But they also can tell you about things that are a problem in the family or where they might need some help and all that kind of thing. Because we say in our company, you know, that God comes first, some relationship. We're not pushing, you know, any particular religion per se, but you ought to have something bigger in your life than yourself. If you don't have any, anything to serve bigger than yourself, what's the only thing to serve? Yourself. Second comes family. Family always is. I mean, I want to tell you, somebody's got an issue with the family, get out of here. Go home and take care of that issue, and then comes the company. Uh, and uh, what's really interesting is then what people, as Gary say, you know, they kill themselves for you. Why? Because they know you're on their side. You're, you care about them. If you had 26 meetings a year for 15 or 30 minutes, you don't want the meetings to go more than 30, would you get to know your people? Would they get to know you? You better believe it. There'd be no, so many performance reviews at the end it's, it's everybody's way. I wonder what the hell I got, you know, and all. I mean, they don't even know what they're being evaluated on half the time and all. And that's why Gary and I wrote Help People Win at Work, because they developed this whole strategy of don't mark my paper, help me get an A. Because this whole concept, if any of you in here have a company where you got a normal distribution curve or you got, you know, leaders who are Jack Welsh lookalikes, you know, and wants you to rank order your people, get a life. You can't build trust when you're doing that. You know, you, how many of you go out and hire losers? We lost some of our, we lost some of our best, our low performers last year. We got to hire some new ones. No, you you hire either winners or potential winners. Why would you want to mark anybody down? Wouldn't you do everything you can to get everybody an A? You know, when the water rises, you know all the boats rise. What is this? So, you know, I mean, that's what's wrong with education. We're working on an initiative in San Diego. How do we make this a servant leadership town? Go on visionsandiego.com, and you'll see what we're trying to do. But we know where all the criminals of the future are in San Diego. They're in the third grade. And that's when they start sorting the kids out. You can't read. You can't do this. And they push them aside. 
pretty soon because they can't read well and all that, they don't perform well, and they end up quitting school, and since they don't have an education, they can't get a really good job, and what do they end up? In the drug market, gangs, all kinds of other stuff, duh. I mean, why are we trying to get every kid an A? People criticize, uh, you know, no kid left behind because the teachers will teach to the test. Why not? What the hell are you giving the test for if you don't want the kids to do well on the test? Don't give them stupid true-false multiple choice tests. Give them tests that push them, but then teach them the answers. That's the whole philosophy. They have pushing goals at WD-40, and then the job of the manager and their one-on-ones and all is to what? Help them get an A. Why do you think they had the best performance year you know, in the history in 2010? Duh. You know, I mean, so a lot of, you know, so much stinking thinking out there. And so you got to know about yourself. You got to know about your people. You got to study your industry. I was just sad the other day. I went to my favorite blockbuster store. And things all being boxed up, selling everything. They're out of business. Why? Because they had their head in the ground. They should have been doing Netflix. They should have been doing all kinds of things. But they continued to do what they was, was doing well. And that's, that's not, you gotta, you gotta have an office of the future. You gotta be looking out uh, there. And then you gotta study leadership. You know, you gotta study leadership. How many of you would be a little concerned if you had a doctor that wasn't keeping up to date? <laughs> you know, I mean, would you really want the, that doctor to give you advice, you know? Why would it be any different than leaders? There's great stuff coming out and great things that they ought to read and understand and all that. So you gotta gain knowledge. Second is the thing that we really push in our program is you got to reach out to others. Look for teachable moments. They, they have wonderful learning moments. They don't talk about mistakes at WD-40. Everything's a learning mode. And every learning moment potentially can turn into a teaching moment by either that manager or somebody around there that can help the, the person. So you got to reach out. Don't keep what you've learned into yourself. Share it with others. And in most companies, you send people to training and then what happens when they come back? Nobody requires them to do anything with what they've learned. Nobody requires them to, to, duh, you just wasted your damn money. Why wouldn't you want people to come back and teach everybody in their group what they learned and then set goals around what they learned, the two or three key things that they ought to be implementing? We waste money in training because it's a fringe benefit. It's not something that's going to do anything for the organization because we don't look at it seriously. You gotta look at it to reach out to others. O stands for open your world to new opportunities. And that's what Gary was saying. You know, I mean, we think you ought to come in the MSEL program, but there's a lot of other good programs here. I don't care what your age is, you gotta open your world. When I turned 65 a couple of years ago, uh, I was uh, talking to Zig Ziglar on the phone, you know, old Ziggy. And uh, he invited Margie and I to the 59th anniversary of his 21st birthday. And uh, <laughs> so he had turned 80, you know, and I said, Zig, you're going to retire? He said, there's no mention of it in the Bible. He said, except for Jesus, Mary, and David, nobody under 80 made an impact. He said, I'm refiring, not retiring. And isn't that a great concept about refiring? And you ought to be refiring all the time. We went down to visit a friend who was in a, in a retirement home in San Diego, in La Jolla. And at dinner, everybody's sitting around the table like this, you know, all look like they're waiting to die. I mean, I said, man, let's grab the microphone. And the discussion question at the table tonight is, you know, I mean, get that place fired up. You know, and uh, so that's what you really need to, to do. Open your world to new experiences, to travel and all. Coming to this program is a new experience. It's uncomfortable for a lot of people because they... They never heard about servant leadership. They were, in, they were never in a, in a small group. We don't have more than 20, 25 in a class, you know, and people actually give you feedback, you know. You need to work on your listening skills a little bit, you know, or you need to, you know, and uh, I mean, the best learning, you know, I, we, I hate to say it, you know, because I'm a great faculty member, the best learning comes from what? The cohort, the people you're, you're with. That, I mean, because you can't get in these programs unless you're in the program. In other words, people can't say, gee, I'd like to take this course. No, I'm sorry, you're not in the cohort. The cohort goes through together. And man, you have your own board of directors, as Gary said, you know, people who really care about you and, and all that kind of thing. So that's just a powerful thing. So you gotta open your world to new experiences. And I wanna tell you, going to graduate school is, is that we had a guy, 
a couple of years ago. He was in his 60s in our program. I said, what are you doing here? He says, man, I got a lot to learn, you know? And uh, it was just great. So uh, it's, it's, it's fabulous. Open your world. And then finally, W is walk towards wisdom. Walk towards wisdom. And look for mentors. Look for people who can make a difference in your life. And you find them very often in your cohort. And you find them in, in, uh, in faculty members and all that kind of thing. And, and so Gary said he's learned a lot from me. I've learned a ton from him. See, because it's not just about you know, who's older or who's, quote, wiser. I want to tell you, I'm learning a lot from my six-year-old grandson, particularly with the computer. He says, Grampy, you know, <laughs> let me show you that. You know, I mean, if we go out to dinner now. He doesn't even bother me. He's on his iPad, you know, killing birds, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, so, you know, that's what's really neat is that don't have this official word for a mentor. It's just mean look for people who can teach you stuff and who maybe got some suggestions uh, for you and all. That's walking towards wisdom. And know that walking towards wisdom is a journey. It's a lifetime journey. Don't stop. Keep on going. I wrote a book with Norman Vincent Peale, wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. I met him at 86 years old. I never met a guy so fired up in my life. And I said, Norman, why are you so excited? He says, I never know what I'm going to learn. Whoa, you know. And that's when he died at 95, finally. Ruth, his wife, who she was the implementer. When we first met her, she had a pad that said Lady Boss. And she died last year at 101. And she had just come back six months before to a trip to China because she wanted to learn what was going on in China. And a friend of mine just wrote a book about this amazing woman who's the last survivor of the Holocaust, the oldest, 108 years old. She lives in London, and it calls a century of wisdom. And you won't believe the wisdom coming out of this woman. The book's just coming out uh, soon. And I, she sent it to me, and I was reading it last night. It blew me away, you know, because one of the questions she asked, she interviewed said, you know, do you have hatred towards the German people? or?" Oh, no. She said, I've always prayed for them. You know, and, and she said, hatred only kills the person with the hate. You know, I mean, oh, duh. You know, I mean, and uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's fabulous stuff. So uh, it's good to have you here. I, my big thought for you is a couple things. One is leadership's not about you. It's about the people you're serving. And secondly, keep on growing. Keep on going. And uh, with our MSAL program, I told you the first thing that I uh, felt that wasn't happening in a lot of programs that weren't teaching about leadership. The second one I want to leave you with is that they were only dealing with people's heads, their intellect, and they were missing their hearts. Because leadership is a heart deal. And the question is, are you here to serve or be served? That's the big question that you have. And what's so interesting, at our graduation, the night before folks graduate from our program, we have a dinner, and they invite all their family and all. And I go around with a microphone and say, what would you get out of this program? And you won't believe the number of people who cry. And I had a videotape of, of one a, a number of years ago. And a guy videotaped me and said to me, you know, this is a leadership program and all? He said, I just did you know, Arizona State graduates from an MBA program, they were all talking about credentials and getting the opportunities for promotions. Your people didn't say anything about that. They talked about the impact on their families, on their marriage, how they really have got to know their people, and what has made a difference for results and human satisfaction. That's what it's all about. So keep growing and come in our program. God bless. There's the book. Ha, <laughs> ha,